Salam kebenaran, apa kabar semuanya buat teman-teman yang ada di seluruh dunia Walaupun anda berada di di mana-mana Tapi kebenaran dan kejujuran itu harus tetap kita pertahankan Di sini kita tidak mengatakan melalui lewat agama Kita tidak sedang berkhotbah Walaupun saya memakai kafiyah di sini Karena saya mendukung, mensupport Palestina Tidak ada hubungannya dengan agama Khusus tentang kebenaran Mari kita di sini kita berbicara tentang beberapa orang yang kita anggap uh, sangat berpengaruh dengan uh, dunia saat ini. Uh, di antaranya adalah teman kita dari uh, The Grey John. The Grey John dari dulu sudah saya uh, katakan mereka adalah uh, beberapa anak muda yang lahir di Palesti- di apa di Amerika, namun Mereka semuanya adalah keturunan dari uh, dari apa namanya keturunan dari para Yahudi atau bangsa-bangsa Israel. Namun mereka melihat kenyataan yang sebenarnya dan mereka ikut membela kebenaran. Hanya seperti yang saya katakan dari pertama di sini kebenaran itu sangat perlu untuk kita dukung walaupun di mana kita berada. Namun kebenaran itu mutlak Mutlak, mutlak Harus kita katakan Ini bukan melalui agama Ini bukan melalui uh, Apa namanya Perbedaan antara Etnik Atau suku-sukuan Ini murni melalui kebenaran Mari kita perhatikan Scott Reed, uh, Teman kita Max Blumenthal Dari The Grey John In Iran, real attacks are coming in, terrorist attacks. A terrorist bombing 48 hours ago claimed the lives of well over 100 people, close to 300 are in, were injured. This was at a family-oriented pilgrimage to the grave site of Major General Qasem Soleimani, the former leader of the IRGC, uh, whose presence is felt in a very powerful way right now. And we want to bring in our guest, Sitara Sadehi. How are you doing, Sitara? I'm pretty good. Good. I know it's late there where you are. You're, you're, you're in. Well, t- tell us where, where you are and just introduce yourself to our audience because uh, I think you'll do it better than I can. Sure. So my name is Sitara Sadehi, and um, I'm currently based in Esfahan. That's where. I was born and raised, and um, I'm a PhD in American studies. I've worked as a freelance journalist and translator, and I'm also uh, a teacher. I teach about U.S. politics at university here for uh, like um, students, like university students here. Well, we're grateful for the work you're doing and for all the contributions you've made to the gray zone. Uh, this terrorist bombing in Kerman took place amid a wave of assassinations, uh, a U.S. assassination of an Iraqi militia leader in Baghdad, an, an Israeli assassination of a Hamas political leader and lead negotiator with Israel, Salah Arouri, in southern Beirut. Um, and I, I would incorrectly stated that you were in Kerman during this bombing, but you had friends there. Um, you've talked to eyewitnesses, so tell us what you've learned about this. Yeah. What, 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 what happened? Yeah, so uh, you know that um, General Soleimani was very, very popular among Iranians, and uh, his funeral back four years ago was reportedly the um, like the biggest funeral ever recorded in history, and the images show that like it was on. Uh, different international channels and uh, huge crowds that came out in different cities showed how popular he was with uh, the vast majority of Iranians. And this annual uh, commemoration for him has been going on for uh, four years this year. And I was actually thinking of joining my friends who were going there, but I had to uh, attend uh, a few work things here, so I couldn't. I talked to my friends, my friends who were there heard the explosion um, 
but they were not in the vicinity of where what exactly happened but i also talked to like friends of friends who were in near where uh the terrorist attack ha happened and as you said it's like a family oriented uh pilgrimage and people go with their children actually um more than i think 53 or more than that of uh the martyrs so far have been women uh 30 of them if not more were under 18 years old and you will have uh like two-year-old babies among the victims so it's um it's very tragic and um i remember like i was just uh, i wanted to make sure that my friends were okay and i messaged them and you know i, I went also on social media to check uh, what people are posting and uh, some of the friends or people that i was following were saying that they were okay but they were near the incidents and some people even witnessed like baby girls with their heads burns and or uh if I think you have also seen that initially the numbers were reported as higher, but then uh, they were adjusted, which was because there were so many body parts and uh, it was very difficult. I mean, um, they were rapidly trying to, uh, you know, count the dead bodies and the, uh, and take care of everything that was happening. So it's been very tragic. Um, but the interesting thing is also that exactly the next day, which was yesterday, there were even more and larger number of people coming uh, to the site where the terrorist attack happened to show that they're, um, you know, they're loyal to um, General Soleimani and that these attacks are not going to push them back from defending what they believe in from their values. And they also wanted to obviously attend the funeral for some of the martyrs. There were also 13 uh, martyrs who were not Iranian, most of them Afghan refugees that were attending uh, the event and they were um, killed in the terrorist attack. So who, who do you think is responsible? We've seen if the Islamic State claim responsibility, this is from the video in which they claimed responsibility. It's a very unusual looking video because as we know exactly. from the Iraqi and Syrian experience, when there was a terrorist bombing or a suicide bombing by ISIS, they would show the face of the perpetrator exactly. after he died. Um, they you know, would honor him essentially, but here they're, we they're wearing masks. Um, there have been arrests in Kerman of the supposed attack team and collaborators. One is from Tajikistan. Um, but you know the MEK is all you know, people's MEK, which is backed by Saudi Arabia and Israel. They often carry out terrorist attacks inside Iran as well. So, what's going on here? Yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone is talking about how unusual the statement by the uh, ISIS is because, uh, as you said, not only they honor them. Sometimes even you would see a video of the perpetrators, like. Uh, they would make a statement before going on the operation, like taking pride in what they're uh, doing. But this time we're seeing uh, that their faces are covered, which is very unusual. And uh, it also somehow took them a longer time than usual to announce that or to take credit for the terrorist attack. Um, even before the ISIS uh, announces uh, or takes credit for the, the terrorist attack, uh, everyone was talking about how it is either, I mean, the operation is carried out either by ISIS, MEK, or directly from Israel. But in all the three cases, I would say, who is behind them? Like, who has trained and funded MEK, who has trained and funded ISIS, and who is funding the ongoing genocide and all the crimes and the occupation uh, of Palestine by Israel? It's had, it has always been the U.S., and Iranians know that very well. MEK is one example, there are a very notorious and, um, I mean, uh, rejected by all Iranians, um, um, a terrorist group, and they used to be on U.S. and EU's uh, list of terrorist organizations, even even when they were on the list of terrorist organizations, as Simon Hirsch uh, wrote about it back many years ago, they were trained in Nevada 
during Bush administration by Mossad and uh, CIA the, the, um, to uh, carry out assassination of Iranian nuclear scientists inside Iran. So these kinds of assassinations and terror attacks were also something that people were expect from the MEK because they have also the MEK has also previously uh, carried uh, terrorist bombings uh, inside the shrines. Uh, I remember when I was uh, probably uh, a teenager or something that a lot of people were died in the shrine in Mashhad because MEK carried out a terrorist bombing. But the thing is, uh, whichever of these, like uh, the MEK or ISIS, um, in, carried out the operation itself, it doesn't look like this is coming, uh, you know, I mean, like the masterminds behind both terrorist organizations have always been the U.S. and Israel. And this is something that Iranians know very well. Uh, even though the U.S. and like spokespersons from the U.S. government try to say that, uh, like, you know, we're, we have nothing to do with this, but Iranians remember the 1953 coup. They remember how the U.S. supported Saddam uh, in its eight war, uh, eight-year war on Iran, how they funded MEK. And people have uh, can also read your book, Max, about management of savagery and how ISIS and other terrorist organizations have been created by the US government and funded. And like, so it doesn't, it doesn't make uh, uh, the US innocent in any ways. And that's how uh, the majority of Iranians are looking at the, the thing. And we have the last sort of ISIS terror attack on Iran that I can remember in 2017, uh, some gunmen ran up in the Iran, Iranian parliament in Tehran and just massacred people. And Donald Trump came out and in such, essentially endorsed this attack, endorsed ISIS and said, those who commit terror will essentially get what they bargained for. Um, almost implying yeah, the US exactly. hand in that attack. Um, we also have the Mossad chief, David Barnea stating, on the day of this attack, that those who took place in October 7th will sign their own death warrant. Okay, we've heard that before from many Israeli officials, but he actually stated at the funeral of the Mossad's founder, Svi Zamir, one of their founders, um, that he is going to continue Zamir's hunt for the 1972 perpetrators of the attack on Israel's Olympic team at the Munich Olympics, which led to this war of the spooks in the 1970s, bloodshed across Europe. It looked like, um, by the way, the Mossad was using, the, at, their, at that time, their version of ISIS was Abu Nidal, who is a supposed Palestinian militant, but the only attacks he carried out were on the PLO, on the PFLP, on Palestinian interests. So every Palestinian understood Abu Nidal to be basically an Israeli agent or a double agent. And so we're seeing these kinds of attacks all over again. It looks like Israel wants to destabilize not just the region, but this could go to Europe as well. Who knows? To Latin America, even to here. What well, I want to ask you, um, cause we, cause we got to kind of, um, we've got to move on to a lot of topics, but I want to ask you, um, Qasem Soleimani's successor, Hossein Salami, the head of the IRGC, has vowed revenge. Um, you can see right to the left, or, or maybe it's, yeah, to my left of this headline, the Israeli Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, declaring time running out for diplomatic solution to Hezbollah tensions, meaning Israel is likely to escalate with Hezbollah after this attack in Beirut. Um, how do you think Iran is likely to respond here? And how do you think Iran's allies, for example, in Hezbollah might respond? Well, it, it looks, I mean, it definitely um, is clear that Israel is looking for more attention and for uh, getting Iran and uh, other resist, I mean, the resistant groups in the region in Iraq and in Lebanon uh, involved in various, you know, um, sorts of attacks so that uh, they cannot have a more concentrated uh, like response to Israel and Israel wants to have the U.S. involved in all these tensions. So 
they have some military backing because they cannot uh, I mean we have we're seeing that this is basically because they're feeling that they're losing the war uh, against Hamas and against Palestinians I'm sure there will be some sort of response by Iran and Hezbollah because uh, the resistant uh, figures are being killed in Iraq and in uh, Lebanon and innocent people have been killed uh, inside I mean in Lebanon and Iraq and inside Iran innocent people have been killed and um, it depends uh, like how the response will be will depend on the more details the intelligence details that will come out because so far at least nine people have been uh, arrested and uh, there's Iran is still working on the details of who has been you know, uh, behind the attacks and where they're getting their information from and everything. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, ISIS also last year to, um, carried out two other uh, uh, terrorist attacks inside Iran, inside a shrine, uh, at the peak of the unrest that were also part of uh, Israeli uh, and U.S. Um, intelligence operations inside Iran. MEK had a very major, had a, like a major role in uh, what happened last year. And something around 60 uh, police officers and security forces in Iran were killed. And Bolton was bragging about how they managed to uh, get the arms to the so-called protesters. Um, so uh, Iran has been waiting for the time to respond to all of that. And the, like, the public opinion in Iran really demands uh, a, res a strong response by Iran, but also uh, a response that is strategically wise and gets the results that the people and the Iranian government wants. Just one last question. This attack came at a march commemorating the, the assassination of General Soleimani. And I'm wondering if you could talk briefly about why he's revered so strongly inside Iran. And um, I'm wondering if you could respond to the process to how he's characterized in the US. So a standard account, like in the New York Times, reporting on this attack, on this march, says that Soleimani is regarded in the West as a malign actor. And then it talks about how, yes, he did play a role in defeating ISIS inside uh, Iran, inside Iraq and Syria, but the Times says he did that alongside a US-led coalition. So that basically the Times is trying to say that the, the defeat of ISIS was done uh, by the US, this US-led coalition, and Soleimani, yes, he played he played some role, but. The main actors here in defeating ISIS were, were the U.S. Yeah, yeah, you know, like we remember the accidentally dropping of the weapons for the terrorists, like ISIS in in Iraq and Syria by the U.S. And I mean, uh, U.S. the U.S. was so obsessed with getting rid of Assad that they did not really care about who they're aligned with and who they're armed. And just just wanted uh, the Syrian government to be. Uh, removed because they were not, you know, they were not doing what the U.S. wanted. But inside Iran, uh, Assam Soleimani has been respected and admired for uh, not only the fight against terrorism and against ISIS, but also the fight against Saddam Hussein. He was uh, he was a key figure in the uh, during the uh, like Iran's defense against Saddam's invasion, and he has been a big part of all. Uh, Iran's defense uh, strategies for many years and people know that he has dedicated his life and he's uh, you know uh, like he, he has sacrificed everything he had to protect the, the country and protect the uh, Iranian people from any invasion uh, and he was you know like aside from uh, or besides his military uh, like in um, I would say uh, capabilities he was also a very modest man he was very uh you know people oriented he was very humble he interacted with people he checked on uh the families of the martyrs very often and um like they called him uncle and he was very soft spoken as um like a family man um so the image that iranians have of him is like they look at him as an uncle who protected them, who defeated I not only ISIS, uh, but also Saddam. And uh, he was the, the, the mastermind behind all uh, Iran's uh, capability to deter 
uh, the attacks. And you know that Iran has always been under, uh, ever since we had the revolution, we have been under uh, threats from Israel, from um, the Ba'ath regime and uh, the Saddam regime from the U.S. And of course, Saddam's invasion of Iran uh, was totally uh, backed and funded by the U.S. and a few other, uh, a few um, European countries. So this is how we remember Qasem Soleimani. And uh, I mean, um, the, there are a lot of people who are um, take, like taking pride and in wanting to be a follower of him and just follow his cause. Uh, that's how we remember him. Yeah, and uh, Eric T. Red, Eric Thomas, who's helping us out from behind the scenes, made a great comment. Imagine how the U.S. would react if some foreign adversary did this to them. Um, there is no general or military figure as revered as Soleimani was in Iran in the U.S. But just imagine if that took place, what the U.S. response would be. And we've seen nothing but strategic patience from Iran um, that I think the other than the attack on the Al-Assad air base in Iraq, in which the U.S. seems to have been notified a little bit ahead of time. There were no, there were no U.S. casualties, there were head injuries, um, but there hasn't been, we haven't seen Iran's full capacity. And going back to my previous comment about the 1970s, the War of the Spooks, um, based on what Israel's been doing, and it's, announced intention to kill political figures around the world, this opens them up to the same possibility, obviously. Reciprocity is real. So we will be continuing to follow that. And um, Satara Sadeghi, thank you for joining us from Iran, uh, scholar, journalist, and translator, and contributor to the Gray Zone. Um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have you back because I think this story is going to be just as relevant next week or in the coming few days. Sure, thanks for having me, Max and Aaron. It was nice talking to you and I look forward to um, seeing you both again. This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. Iran is observing a national day of mourning as the death toll from twin explosions Wednesdays has, has reached 84, with many others injured. The blasts in South Central Kerman province killed attendees to a memorial for top Revolutionary Guards General Qasem Soleimani, who was assassinated in a U.S. drone strike four years ago in Iraq. This is a survivor who was being treated in a nearby hospital. I suddenly felt a burn in my back, and then when I tried to move, I couldn't. What happened? I just remember hearing the sound of an explosion. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack, but Iran has placed blame on Israel and the U.S. The White House said the Islamic State could be behind the bloody bombings and rejected claims Israel or the U.S. was involved. The tragedy comes amid mounting fears that Israel's war on Gaza could lead to a wider regional conflict. One day before the blast, a senior Hamas leader and Iran ally, Saleh al-Aruri, was killed in a strike in southern Beirut, which Lebanese officials blamed on Israel. And earlier today, a drone strike killed four members of an Iranian-backed Iraqi militia in Baghdad. Iraqi authorities have blamed the U.S.-led international coalition for the attack. For more, we're joined by Arash Azizi, Iranian historian and writer. His book is titled The Shadow Commander, Soleimani, the U.S. and Iran's Global Ambitions. His recent piece in the nation is headlined, in the national, is headlined, Who are the likely suspects in the Kerman blasts and what does this mean for Iran? His forthcoming book out next is titled What Iranians Want, Women, Life, Freedom. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Arash Azizi. Can you start off by talking about the significance of these two attacks in Iran? No one has yet claimed responsibility, but what you think this looks like. 
So these are really terrible attacks. If you look at the death toll, although the death toll is actually being readjusted with lower now, now it's between 80s and 90s, but it still makes it one of the deadliest, if not the deadliest attack of its kind in, in recent history, perhaps even in sort of modern Iranian history. Uh, so they're, they're truly terrible. And of course, they do come at a time when the region is very tense. There's been a shadow war between Iran and Israel and the United States for many years now, but especially in the last few months. Um, and the anniversary of Soleimani's killing four years ago is already a very tense stay because um, you know it, it involves a lot of groups in Iraq in Lebanon in Iran um, and you know Israel Syria uh, a lot of them are linked to Soleimani in, in one way or the other so it's a very tense time and the attack comes at at that time now it is true that we we don't really know who did the attack yet no one has really claimed it yet um, a lot of ex experts that I've spoken to and myself looking at uh, the existing evidence um, believe that it's sort of the likely culprit, in my opinion, is to be the Islamic State, particularly its group, uh, its regional group based in Afghanistan, no, known as ISIS Khorasan, uh, Khorasan province. Um, and this is a group that, because of the kind of attacks that it did, kind of a mass civilian killing, because of the, you know, putting the bombs in briefcases, and, and you know, some of the more, uh, you know, some of the more specific uh, uh, methods used, um, and the targets that they picked, this makes them to be the most and likely culprit uh, that have uh, committed the attack. So, Arash, can you explain, I mean, you've written this book on, on Qasem Soleimani, the, the significance of this attack taking place uh, on the day, the fourth anniversary of his death, as, as people were gathering uh, in his burial place it, where his uh, uh, body is. Uh, but why would the Islamic State, as you said, Islamic State Khorasan, why would they, what would be the incentive for them to carry out an attack now in the midst, as you say, uh, of the uh, what's going on in Gaza, uh, just the, the attack uh, now in Kerman taking place just a day after Al uh, Huri was uh, Aruri was assassinated in Beirut. Why Islamic State? Um, you know, it's it's likely that they might have planned this attack long ago. Um, uh, in, they, um, it might have also been more recent, but I'm um, certainly longer than our, you know Ar Aruri's assassination. So it might not be directly sort of related to that. Um, so they probably planned it a while ago. Now, this group has tried to gain power in, in Afghanistan in recent years. They are also an adversary of the Taliban regime there, which they see it as some sort of a, in some sort of a tacit alliance with Iran, although the Taliban regime and the Islamic Republic of Iran have a complicated relationship, but they've sometimes worked together in the last couple of years, although Iran doesn't even officially recognize it as, as, the, government of, uh, as the government of Af Afghanistan. Um, but this group has tried to raise its profile. Um, th that's one thing. Um, and also, they regard Soleimani as the leader of this Shia force that they, they consider as an enemy, um, as sort of a symbol of, of Shia Islam and a symbol of the Islamic Republic, and, and also a, a sort of symbol of, of Iran in this, as they regard it as such. So it would make sense for them to attack it. Al although I would say the fact that they haven't uh, uh, taking responsibility yet does give me a bit of pause because if they did it, you know, why wouldn't they already uh, take responsibility for it? Um, and and there, there's possibility that there might be other groups and uh, smaller groups, but again, if it's them, why haven't they taken responsibility? So that's one question that uh, a lot of us are uh, asking right now. I should also say that the National Security Council of Iran met this morning, uh, Iranian time, and you know, after the meeting, um, they issued a statement uh, in which they're also very clear that they also don't know who committed the attacks yet and that the, they put sort of the first priority um, in finding out who did the attacks, um, who are behind it. Um, so the, uh, while, you know, the Iranian officials in broad terms condemn Israel and the U.S. as sort of enemies that are behind uh, troubles against Iran, as, as they always do, they haven't actually, the sort of, the bodies like the Supreme National Security Council uh, haven't pointed direct fingers as, as who would be the perpetrator. Um, and, you know, they have promised, of course, uh, to act against whoever uh, did the attack. And Arash, the people who were killed, as we said, about 84, you said uh, somewhere uh, between 80 and 90 people, none of those people were uh, in any way associated with the government, the Revolutionary Guard, because as, as you've said also, I mean, when they've been attacks, uh, perpetrated by either the U.S. Israel, as you say in your piece, has carried out many operations in Iran, but they tend to be targeted against specific people. I mean, most notably the the series of assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists. But in this case, That's who was among the dead? That's right. They usually target either IRGC officials, this militia that really rules the things in Iran, or the nuclear scientists. 
um, and do they have a specific attacks, uh, they, they specific targets, which in this case, um, there doesn't seem to have been any, even a sort of a mid ranking RGC official there. Uh, so that makes it, in my opinion, less likely that, that it was an attack uh, by them, although not impossible, but, but much less likely. Um, so uh, in terms of who was the, uh, who are the victims from what we can see so far, you know, ordinary people, ordinary civilians. Um, yes, a lot of them might have been there to uh, mourn Qasem Soleimani in some ways, but I should also say this is this is a big cemetery in the you know in Kerman, where it's my maternal city. Is, you know, I've, I've been to the cemetery many times. There are tons of ordinary people who are buried there. In fact, it was Mother's Day in Iran uh, also around that day, so many people might have been just going to their mother's uh, grave at this custom 